started Gracias. with our sorry this is very loud okay. <laughs> <laughs> with the music playing <laughs> Okay, if you could please sit down so that we can start uh, the rest of the session this morning. Okay, so... Um, uh, just a brief announcement, thanks to those of you who sent the titles for the talk, so now they've been um, uploaded on the web, so the web page is up to date with all the invited speakers, um, their, the titles of their talks for anyone who wants to look at that. Uh, so we should get started again, so our um, third lecturer is Eric Linder. Eric is um, at UC Berkeley and Berkeley Lab as part of the uh, Berkeley uh, Center for Cosmological Physics, so that joins the two, and uh, is, um, he was, uh, until this year, an organizer of this workshop, and uh, somebody who made it very successful as well, but we have the pleasure to have him as a lecturer this year, and uh, so he's going to talk today about push and pull and wiggle of gravity, so, Eric? Okay, it's a pleasure to, to be back here. <coughs> So unlike the first two lectures that you heard, which were mini courses, this is supposed to be a, a, a hot topic research lecture, talking about the state of the art. But if you have any questions along the way, if, if there's some of the background that you're not familiar with, then again, please ask questions as, as we go along and then uh, during the lecture and then in the afternoon, uh, we'll have a chance to go over it as well. So I, I chose this title because I wanted to talk about three things that uh, affect uh, gravity on cosmological scales. So what do I mean by the, the push, the pull, and, and the wiggle of gravity? <laughs> so for the, the push of, of gravity, I'm going to be talking about cosmic acceleration and dark energy. For the pull of gravity, I'll talk about uh, clustering and how gravity affects the motion of not only matter, but of light including uh, gravitational lensing. And then the wiggle of gravity, I'm going to talk about the tensor sector, that is the gravitational waves, and how we've realized in the last year or two that this actually is extremely important and gives us a lot of additional information on the nature of cosmic acceleration and uh, in our universe. So let me start off then talking about dark energy. And pretty much anything that you can write down or show about dark energy is not right, is, is not actually talking about dark energy. And so there's a, a wonderful painting from René Magritte that many of you are, are familiar with. It's a painting of a pipe, and the title of the painting is, This is Not a Pipe. And so it makes you reassess. You're saying, I'm looking at a pipe. Why is he saying it's not a pipe? And the idea is that our models, our images that we have, is not the reality. And in fact, he titles this painting, The Treachery of Images. And so we always have to be very careful when we have models of the universe to remind ourselves that these are approximations, these are particular views, and that we have to be very careful in comparing to the data and interpreting the data as to how we put some of our own prejudices in there. And so I'm going to try to, to take a more sort of model independent approach during this talk. And so you can translate this in a different way and say, this is not dark energy. Any picture I put up there, you could pretty much say, this is not dark energy. We don't actually know what dark energy is. Well, what can we say about dark energy? The first thing is, remember, we don't have a, a standard model for dark energy the way we have for particle physics. So the baryonic sector of the universe, the 5% of the universe, we do have a standard model for it. And of course, there's a huge community trying to go beyond that standard model. We don't have a standard model on cosmic acceleration, on dark energy. We have no theoretical understanding of what it is or why it should be that way. But even if there is, 
you remember how many decades it took to put the standard model of particle physics together to understand the, the leptons, understand the quarks, and so forth, and the interactions, all the forces, should we expect dark energy to be much simpler than the 5% of the universe that we know about? Should it be something where we just have a single number and we say, OK, that's dark energy? It could be very complicated, and it could take many decades to, to work out. And so there could, there could be more complications. And of course, that, that's a, a good thing. We learn a lot of physics, and we stay employed for many decades trying to figure it all out. So when we approach dark energy, there's sort of the early approach that people took when they first started thinking about it, where they would choose a particular model and then calculate the consequences. So they would choose the cosmological constant. They would choose a scalar field, maybe with a particular potential. And they would calculate the consequences of this. And you get results then within that specific model. And then there was another approach that, that came around a little bit later, and is sort of the, the standard approach now which is a more phenomenological approach, where you try to talk about the properties of the dark energy without restricting yourself to just one single theory. And then there's an approach that's become popular within the last couple of years, the effective field theory approach. And I'm going to spend a fair amount of time talking about that because, again, it's, it's new, and I think it has some, some important lessons. And I do want to point out that in the 2012 version of this Cosmology on the Beach School, we did have a whole course of lectures on the effective field theory of cosmology given by Cliff Burgess. All of the lectures from the, the, the past Cosmology on the Beaches are on the web, and so you can refresh your, your, uh, your knowledge by looking back at those, at those lectures. But again, effective field theory as applied to dark energy is, is fairly recent, really from 2012. And I'm going to particularly talk about a, a recent paper from last month done uh, with graduate student uh, Gizem Sengler and Scott Watson. OK, so what's the model approach? The model approach is you just write down your favorite model. The problem is, if you survey across this room, you're not going to get one favorite model. You're going to get you know, 50, 100 different favorite models. No one's going to believe that the model that one person likes is their favorite model as well. The other thing is, is you tend to have very arbitrary things. You write down a potential. How do you choose what potential you write down for that, that theory, uh, even for the simplest theories? And even on the theoretical foundations, they, they aren't really good theories in the fact that there's a lot of fine tuning that needs to come in on both the classical level and, and certainly when you get to the quantum correction level. And so whatever someone writes down, it's hard to convince someone else that, yes, this is the theory you should you should dedicate your, your life or your thesis to. One of the early types of models that had some attractive features were tracker models, where basically they would sort of erase their initial conditions and go on to an attractor trajectory. And so that was nice in that you, you didn't have a certain brand of fine tuning. But it was actually realized very early, by the, the early 2000s, that these models didn't actually describe our universe, that uh, you would not get a universe that looks like the present in, in almost all these tracker models, unless you went back in and fine-tuned them. It doesn't mean the class is ruled out, but it means that they're pushed into a corner of the parameter space that's very close to a cosmological constant lambda. And so then they're not really getting the advantages of a tracker model. So basically, I've sort of given up on dealing with any specific model. There's one model that I, that I do still have some fondness for, called the PNGB model, pseudo nambo Godson boson model because it does have some, some theoretical justification behind it and some, some the theoretical symmetries behind it, in particular the shift symmetry, which gets rid of some of the, the quantum corrections and, and so forth. So it looks like a, a cosine potential here. And again, this was developed very, very early on, so more than 20 years ago now. Um, but it's already been constrained fairly well. So here's a, a paper from this last year showing the symmetry scale as a function of the, as a ratio to the Planck mass, and basically the initial conditions. And you can see the observations are pushing you up here. As f gets very large, you can see what's happening. As f gets very large, then this is basically just going to a constant for any sort of finite value of the field. And you end up with a cosmological constant. And so that shows that the observations are pushing even this model basically just toward a cosmological constant behavior. 
And so that's, that's one of the reasons why I like these model independent approaches, because it's really hard on both a theoretical and an observational ground to, to really see anything distinct in any one particular model. So what about the phenomenological approach? Well, we have certain observational handles on dark energy. And we can then describe them in classes of dark energy rather than in specific models. So we can measure distances and measure the expansion history of the universe. And this is essentially equivalent to measuring the equation of state. So Raphael introduced that this morning, the pressure to density ratio of the component of the dark energy. And it's a function of time, W of Z. And that's basically the same thing as the expansion history that, that was shown, the, the A of T, scale factor. You might have uh, clustering in your dark energy component. It may not be completely smooth the way a, a cosmological constant is. And this tells you something about the microphysics that goes into it. And you can think of that in a phenomenological way in terms of the sound speed as a function of time. And then we can also do tests such as how is the expansion history different from the growth history of structure in the universe. And if we see some uh, offset between the two, some discrepancy between the two, this could lead us to expectations of either modified gravity or some dark energy club clustering or coupling between the dark energy and the matter sector. Um, and neutrinos will also give you a, such an offset if you haven't realized that there should be massive neutrinos. And Marilena will, will be talking about that later, later in the week. So we have these sort of phenomenological handles. And that lets you then sort of categorize things into broad classes. Are you talking about a physical scalar field, a, a degree of freedom in, in that sense? Or are you talking about a, a modification of gravity? And these are sort of the, the, the thing, the, the first class of, of question that we would like answered is, are we talking about a new component or a change in, in the laws of gravity, for example? So continuing on with the phenomenology, and in particular concentrating on this first part of, on the expansion history, <laughs> as I said before, the expansion history is equivalent to talking about the equation of state. And so we can look at the phase space of that equation of state, its value and a measure of its time variation. So W prime, you can think of it as, as the time derivative. It's the derivative with respect to the log of the scale factor or the E-folding factor. And so what you find if you do the, the solutions of the equations of motion, the Klein-Gordon equations, that in this phase space of W versus W prime, where the cosmological constant sits right there, W is minus 1, no time variation, that you get this, this behavior where the fields today have to live in certain restricted regions of the phase space. And the reason for that is basically that we're in an old universe, that the universe went through a radiation-dominated epoch, a matter-dominated epoch. When the field is evolving the whole time, it's driven by the radiation domination, driven by the matter domination. And that makes it basically today lie in one of these two regions. And you can get a better physical idea for why when you plot the line of, of zero acceleration of the field, not acceleration of the universe, but acceleration of the field motion. It lies right in between the two. And so because the universe is old, this sort of fine-tuning balance that you'd have to act where the kinetic and the potential energy exactly offset each other to give you this coasting behavior, it can't maintain itself for very long. And so you're driven away from that line into one of these two uh, boundaries here. So for the first time, once we realize that you have these two distinct regions, we now have a goal in how well we want the experiments to measure W and W prime. We want to be able to separate these two regions. And so based on the distance between those, that says you want to measure the time variation. So you don't want to measure only W, but you want to measure its time variation, to this accuracy. The problem is that both of these regions approach the cosmological constant, and we have no way of deciding how far from the cosmological constant. So we've separated things in the vertical area, how well the experiments need to measure, but not in the horizontal area. We don't know how far from the cosmological constant we need to, to get the precision of our measurements to distinguish the thawing and the freezing and the cosmological constant as we get very close to minus one. And so that's an open puzzle. We don't know how good our experiments need to be in that sense. So 
we can take these regions, and now we can go back to our specific models, and we can ask, OK, suppose someone does have a favorite model and write it down. So they might have their PNGV model favorite, a linear potential, a, a, a cortic potential, a brain world model, a supergravity model. And you can plot that in that phase space. So, so the, the triangles I showed before are now yellow triangles. And you can see that something like the PNGB model has these tracks in space which diverge from each other, but they all lie within this region, supergravity models. Again, you have this red curve and this red curve. They look distinct from each other, but they all lie within this region. So a phase space is, is a function of two functions of time. W as a function of time and W prime as a function of time. You might say, can we simplify this in some way? Can we compress the information in the functions down to just numbers? It's very hard to constrain two functions, but we can constrain two numbers with observations. So since these are functions of time, is there a way we can sort of stretch the time coordinate in such a way to calibrate the functions? This is what you do with supernovae, right? Supernovae, they, you have a brightness, broadness relationship, the, the light curves, and they stretch the time, artificially, of course, in, in, in the analysis, in such a way to standardize the supernovae. So you have this, this stretch or this decline relation. Can we do the same thing for the phase space? So let's stretch the time coordinate in this particular way, where a star is just a constant, a scale factor, which is determined by the fact that the universe is not that far from the transition from matter domination to dark energy domination. And so we're going to take two functions and ask, can we condense it to just down to two numbers? If we stretch the time in this particular way, then we come up with two parameters, the value of w today and a a, a characteristic time scale related to W prime, which we'll call WA. And now you can see that these supergravity curves, which were very different in the phase space, lie in this very narrow swath of this new phase space. The PNGV curves, which again diverged over here, lie in a very narrow swath. So we've taken these two functions and converted them over to two numbers. So this is work that Roland de Putter did. Roland is, is here at, the, at this conference. And you see we get these, these nice calibrated relations. And we've been very successful then at using only two numbers. And so this is a, a thing that makes it much easier to, to compare to observations. So those two numbers, remember they're describing the equation of state. And the equation of state is the expansion history. So in this phenomenological sense, all you need to know about cosmic acceleration are these two numbers. And you're at the 0.1% level when you compare them to actual observables, whether you use this phenomenological approach or you do the exact numerical solutions of the Klein-Gordon equations to get these observables. And so that's why I say it's all you need to know, because you don't need to do better than 0.1%. So even for the next generation, the, the LSSTs and DESIs, we've, we've been successful at making our two functions of time into two numbers. And again, there's physics behind that. We live in an old universe. You have exact solutions of the Klein-Gordon equations that you've recalibrated by stretching the time. And that's where they come from. Okay. If you look back at the original papers, Taylor expansions are never mentioned anywhere in there. People look at this and they say, oh, that's a Taylor expansion around A equals 1. That's not where they came from. They came from the physics. <laughs> Let's now. We'll come back to dark energy and, and what I call the push of gravity. Now let's look at the, the structure in the universe and how gravity affects that. So, oops. There we go. So again, Raphael introduced this already by saying one of the, the tenets of general relativity is that space-time tells matter how to move. And this has a number of aspects to it. It moves matter around, and so matter grows, as in the simulations that we saw from, from Katrin's lecture, and you get clustering of matter. As the matter moves, it, of course, has velocities, and we can measure those velocities through things like redshift space distortions. And, of course, it moves light around as well. That's gravitational lensing. And so we have these three handles on how gravity affects the, the universe through the motion of matter and the ma motion of light. There are some things that we can say in general. 
if we add an extra scalar force, for example, we, we make a scalar tensor theory of gravity, then generically the scalar force is attractive. And so it's going to increase the growth of matter, it's going to increase the velocities, the motions of matter, and because it's a scalar, it's not going to affect light. Light doesn't care about, about scalar forces because it has, has no trace in the energy momentum tensor. Most theories of modified gravity, not, not all of them, will basically add an extra scalar degree of, of freedom. And so generically, you might then say, OK, we should basically increase these and not affect the, the lensing. And this now allows us to sort of categorize different theories of gravity by asking, is that true? Is, is it the scalar uh, extra force that's causing uh, the modification of gravity? So if we look at the current state of observations, we can look at the effect of gravity on the motion of matter, on, on the, uh, the velocities, through the redshift space distortion effect, and we can measure the growth rate. What's, what, so that's basically a, 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 a logarithmic growth rate, um, f times sigma eight. So these two parameters are put together, but it's basically just this growth rate. D is the growth factor. And then from a number of surveys, we have data on that. Within the Lambda CDM model of the universe, that's this blue swath. So that's the prediction for the, the growth rate. So basically, the expansion history plus general relativity is predicting the growth history. And we can ask, is the expansion history now consistent with the growth history? Are we consistent with the blue curve? And you can see that basically, yes. The, the error bars are large enough that, that yes. But you might get a little bit uncomfortable in that it looks like almost all of these are actually lower than the blue curve. They're consistent with it, but they're all a bit low. Growth seems suppressed. But remember on the previous slide, we generically said that a scalar theory, a scalar modification of gravity should enhance growth. And we're getting a suppression. So it looks like if this is true, not only are we not just general relativity, but we're not modified gravity in, in the standard way we'd expect it. So what's going on? So again, the size of the error bars are such that you may or may not lose sleep over this, but there are plenty of papers that, that talk about that. So one possibility is growth is suppressed, and one way of doing that is, is through neutrino mass, and again, Marie Leno will be talking about that. There are theories of gravity that can suppress, but one of the things that, that we should sort of first satisfy ourselves of is to get these measurements, to, to put these, these points on the plot, you can't use only linear perturbation theory. You have to go beyond linear perturbation theory to clustering on smaller scales. And is our understanding of the smaller scales, the higher order perturbation theory, actually good enough that these points should be interpreted as really telling us about the, the large scale cosmology or do we not understand enough uh, the perturbation theory? And so that's still uh, a, a question that I think needs to, to be addressed. Many groups have many varieties of higher order perturbation theory. Of course, all the experiments want to push to use more and more of their data, push to smaller and smaller scales. But we have to be a little bit worried about whether it's been done properly or, or not. So we can. Again, this is assuming a lambda CDM cosmology. We might want to, again, test expansion versus growth in a more model independent way. We don't want to assume the expansion history necessarily to test the growth history. And so that's what was done in uh, an analysis like this, led by Yonsun Song. It uses that same uh, Sloan Digital Sky Survey, BOSS data, but it's doing it in a model independent way, testing expansion versus distances, expand, uh, distances versus growth, expansion versus growth, and growth in, in density versus growth in velocity, basically. And you get error contours then in this model independent approach. And then you can start to say, what theories are consistent with that? So the x's that you see here, all within the 68% confidence limit, are what you get from the Planck cosmology of lambda CDM plus general relativity. And so we see we are consistent at one sigma with all of these different tests. And again, it's not only model independent, but these are ways of, of having different tests of uh, gravity as, as you go along. 
it's very important when you do this, when you go into these growths, that you have to treat the clustering, the beyond linear clustering. If you're testing gravity, your, your perturbation theory has to take into account that the perturbation theory is changed because you're no longer in general relativity. And so there are some groups that are, are doing this in both simulations and in perturbation theory. Um, this particular one uses the work of Kazuya Koyama, Tsushi Teruya, and collaborators. Um, but many papers you'll see in the literature just assume the lambda CDM, the general relativity constraints, even though they're, they're, they're testing gravity itself. So you, you want to be a bit cautious about that. A different way of doing the model <coughs> independent approach is the formalism of uh, Mortensen, Hu, and Hutterer, where they take different classes of theories and they look at the growth rate, the distances, and the Hubble parameter expansion, and they ask, <coughs> how would, what's the generic prediction within different classes? And so the, the gray bands that you see is if you assume lambda CDM and you vary all the parameters within lambda CDM, the blue bands enlarge that to scalar field quintessence, and you see that, that you, you get certain predictions that you can't deviate arbitrarily much from growth distance and, and Hubble parameter <coughs> in those theories <coughs> without being in disagreement with observations. And in particular, growth, it's almost impossible to enhance growth within these theories. Growth is almost always suppressed toward the negative end. Distances tend to be increased. Hubble parameters can, can sort of go both ways. And so if we actually did detect an enhancement of growth, then I would say you falsify these entire classes of theories. You have to do, uh, get a different class of theories that enhances growth, such as scalar tensor gravity. Of course, what we, what we saw in, in the observations is we actually are seeing possibly a suppression of growth. And so then there's no particular signature of modified gravity. You could do it all with, with quintessence. The cosmic microwave background is a, a really valuable addition to these galaxy surveys in that, for one thing, it can probe early dark energy. Was there some small percentage of dark energy back in, in uh, rec near recombination, redshift of 1,000 or so, and can test early growth? I'll be talking a little bit about cosmic microwave background gravitational lensing as an important probe. Um, and I think that this is, again, something that within the last five years has been developed and will be very important in the next several years as a probe that um, goes along very well with the, the galaxy surveys as, uh, in addition. So I want to talk a little bit more about how you connect modified gravity sort of theory and phenomenology with the observation, and in particular give some cautions about that. When we write down the field equations, the Einstein field equations or, or the equations that you get from the action, they are in coordinates of space and time. And so you get something like a modified Poisson equation where we generalize Newton's constant to a function of space and time. When we do many of our analyses, however, when we interpret our data, we like to work in Fourier space. We work in CMB multiples. We work in, in, in galaxy survey multiples or Fourier modes. And we write an equation like that. These equations are not equivalent to each other. We, we need to keep that in mind. That is, the Fourier transformer of this equation is not this equation, because you have a convolution of a scale-dependent function and a scale-dependent function. And they're not separable, whereas everyone always does separate them. So we need to be a little bit cautious in our interpretation. People also like to test general relativity by looking at what's called the gravitational slip in general theories of of modified gravity, you have two different metric potentials, basically a time-time perturbation and a space-space perturbation. In general relativity, those are equivalent, and so this eta is equal to 1. Again, it, it depends whether you do that in configuration space or you do that in Fourier space. They're not equivalent. You can't Fourier transform a ratio to get a ratio of Fourier transforms. So you always have to be very consistent with what you're working on. And in fact, you can get wrong answers by not realizing that you've essentially done an incorrect Fourier transform. 
So you have to be consistent in what space you're working on, but even if you are consistent, there are still things that can go wrong. For example, again, you, you, we like to do lots of nonlinear functions. We like to do power spectra, which are two-point functions. You cannot separate out the, if you have a scale dependence, you cannot separate out the power spectrum part from what you got from, from your Poisson equation, although everyone does. Okay? You have to be careful in your interpretation of, of what you're actually getting out, because now you have this additional scale dependence. Another common bit of wisdom, which is not quite right, is that lensing only depends on the sum of the two potentials, whereas galaxy clustering, for example, depends on only a single potential, and that this is a way we can test gravity and we can distinguish between gravity theory. Formally, if you're very careful with your words, this is true. Lensing depends only on these, the sum of these functions. But when you apply it to your observations, you add additional assumptions, which are which, which falsify this. So let's take a, a particular theory of gravity called DGP gravity. <laughs> here's the, the one of the metric potentials, and here's the other metric potential in DGP gravity. You have the no, normal Newtonian potential, and then you have these R, one over R cubed correction terms. And now let's calculate gravitational lensing. Basic general relativity introductory course calculation. Here's the deflection angle. It depends only on the sum of those functions. But now we're doing a nonlinear convolution. We're tracing along the ray. Okay? We're adding up these phi plus size from different r's with a nonlinear dependence. And this is the answer you get in DGP. You get the sum of the potentials at the impact parameter, at the closest approach. But you also get a term based on the difference of the potentials. So formally, this is true. When you apply it to observations, it's not true. So you need to be very careful about this. Let me finish the slide, and then I'll take the question. A very popular test of gravity uh, that was introduced several years ago is this EG test. And it was advertised as a way to look for this gravitational slip, to look for the sum of potentials. The EG test is basically taking a correlation function divided by another correlation function. But again, it's integrating over many scales. And when you do that, again, you no longer have just the sum of potentials. And so you're not actually measuring what you claim you're measuring in, in the papers. And so when you do these modified gravity tests, we're getting into the, the realm of precision, where you really do need to be a little bit careful about your interpretation. Now, was a question? I, I can't even hear you, so we need the microphone. <laughs> Sorry, just so I understand the statement, uh, you were referring to the um, line of sight propagation of the photon. Yeah. So does this issue not arise in the single lens plane approximation? Sorry, not arise in? If you take lensing to be at a, a single plane? No, it's, it still does. I mean, even for just a point mass, right? The, this is just for a point mass, the, these deflection formulas. But you're still integrating Right, to, to, to find the Einstein deflection formula the way you no, normally do, right, you're still integrating whether you take the Born approximation that it's just you know, a straight, basically a, a straight unperturbed ray, you're still integrating over many little r's. Right? The, this s is, is your, your affine parameter basically along the ray. You're still integrating over many r's, and this is you know, square root of, of r squared plus b squared. So you have a nonlinear function. And that's why you, you get this change from the, the, the sum in, term, in a functional t dependence to not just the sum when you evaluate it at a particular radius, the, the impact parameter. Got it. And that goes back to this Fourier space going from Fourier it's, it's, to Yeah, it's related to, to that convolution. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So, so I'm not saying we can't do modified gravity. I'm just saying you've got to be really careful to make sure you're interpreting it in, in the right way, your answers. So again, this all arises because the, many theories of modified gravity have a scale dependence. So let me talk a little bit more about other things that have scale dependence and how we can actually test this with the observations. So there's many different theories. Many, a lot of new physics can give you a scale dependence. Modified gravity is one of them. And there's 
different ways we can measure it. One of the, the methods that I'm, uh, is my particular favorite is, is the lensing of the microwave background. It's very clean in the, the theoretical interpretation, and the measurements are really advancing very rapidly. And so here's the deflection, the power spectrum of the deflection field as a function of multiple. And these are the differences relative to what you get in lambda CDM for three different types of scale-dependent new physics. So I can either put in a modified theory of gravity, which has a Compton scale associated with it. So if you're doing f of r gravity, you have this Compton scale due to the, the mass of the scalar on, for example. You have neutrino free streaming scale is another type of scale dependence. And you might have a sound horizon from uh, dark energy, what, what's called cold dark energy with a low sound speed, a sound speed not equal to the speed of light. So these are three different cases. And this shows how you change the CMD lensing power spectrum in those cases. Modified gravity enhances. Neutrinos suppress the power. And clustering dark energy, you might think, should enhance because you're adding extra clustering. But the only time that, that clustering is effective for dark energy is when W is not minus 1. And so here I've taken W of minus 0.9, and that suppresses your power. Okay, so you see a suppression. And then this shows the deviation relative to lambda CDM. And you see you're getting sort of few percent deviation. Within five years, we will be able to measure things at the few percent level for CMB lensing. And so this is an exciting prospect that we can actually look for different types of new physics, each of which have distinct signatures. And so not only could we detect new physics, but we could tell what type of new physics it is. And again, I want to highlight the, the work of Ali Reza Hojati uh, in doing this analysis. So I talked about the push and the pull of gravity. And then the third part of my talk was, was the, the more mysterious sounding, the wiggle of gravity. So what do I, I mean by that? <laughs> and by that, I want to talk about, instead of clustering of matter, lensing of matter, that's all the scalar sector. I want to talk about the tensor sector of gravity. And it's really just within sort of the last year and a half that we've realized how important that is for understanding cosmic acceleration. Oh, OK, yeah. OK, so again, we have these, these time dependences. I talked a bit about the scale dependence. What about the time dependence of these functions? So a fairly new way of doing this is the effective field theory of dark energy. Effective field theories have been around for a very long time. But applied to cosmic acceleration, it's really become a, an, a very interesting active area within the last several years. The idea behind the effective field theory is you can write down the most general theory subject to certain symmetries that you think are reasonable symmetries. And so it's a, a very model independent way of writing things down. You also don't have to impose by hand different limits that you do when you derive the, 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 the theories in other ways, such as saying, I don't want more than two spatial derivatives. Okay, that's something you have to add in by hand, for example, to get what's called the Horngeski class of theory. Effective field theories, you don't have to do that. It, it comes out automatically from the structure of the theory. And so for those who work in modified gravity, Horndesky theory is the, the most general theory of, of uh, a, a, a scalar uh, uh, addition to gravity with two derivatives. Effective field theories include all that and include beyond that as well. So it includes lambda CDM, it includes quintessence, F of R theories, it includes all of these things within a single framework. And so that's one of the attractive features of it, that you can try to derive very general uh, answers. I'm not going to write down what the action is. It's a big, long, messy action. You can find it in, in many papers. I want to instead concentrate on, on sort of the result that you get out of, of doing this. When you do write it down, you get nine operators that have time-dependent coefficients. So you have nine free functions in this most general theory. And so you might say, how am I possibly going to constrain with observations nine new operators? Well, two of them are fixed by the, the background equations, the Friedman equations. And so you basically get two of them you can translate over to the expansion history H of Z, which you wanted to find anyway. But what that means is if you measure the expansion history H of Z or the equation of state W of Z to infinite precision, 
you still have these seven extra free functions of time. You haven't solved cosmic acceleration. You, you've solved maybe two-ninths of cosmic acceleration. So that's something that you have to, to, to think about. If you restrict yourself to these Horndesky theories, that imposes an extra three conditions. And so now you're down to four free functions of time. And it turns out, and it's a pure coincidence, that there are basically four fundamental observational functions. And so in the Horndesky case, you have basically four functions of time that you want to, to determine, four sort of observational functions. They don't actually map one for one onto each other. But more important is, if you go beyond Horndesky, you sort of have four observables and you have seven functions of time, which tells you you're never going to find the unique theory, no matter how good your observations are. So again, it's, it's sort of a cautionary tale in doing this. What, are the, what, what do I call these four fundamental observations, observational function of time? There's the gravitational coupling as far as matter goes. And so basically, this is how matter grows. You get from cosmic structure surveys. How gravity affects light, the gravitational coupling with respect to light, you get from gravitational lensing. You can combine these two into the gravitational slip, the, this eta parameter I showed before. And those come from the scalar sector. From the tensor sector, you have the propagation speed of gravitational waves. We haven't observed gravitational waves yet, so we haven't measured this yet. And you have the running of the Planck math, which also affects the propagation of gravitational waves. And so you get two functions from the scalar sector, two functions from the, the tensor sector. And so these general lessons that, that I want you to take away, far more than any equation or action I write down, is and again, these have really only come to consciousness within the community within the last year to two years. The tensor sector has equal information to the scalar sector. We've been concentrating so much on how do galaxies cluster and so forth. We should start thinking about what's going on with gravitational waves a bit more. The background, again, we've been, we've been spending years and years, how do we measure the distances to objects? How do we measure the expansion rate of the universe? that has one-fifth or less of the information in the, in the full effective field theory. So it's a very important to do, but don't think that you've, you've finished the project, you've, you've, you've understood your standard model of physics, if all you've done is measure H of Z. So again, this is, is something that people have only realized fairly recently. There's a lot more to do. How do we get to that tensor information? Well, it's gravitational waves. We get to the gravitational waves, through cosmic microwave background polarization experiments, looking at the B modes. These have been detected due to gravitational lensing, due to sort of secondary anisotropies. They have not been detected from the primordial inflationary gravitational waves yet, but there's generations of experiments that are gradually progressing, getting better and better constraints. We can also get them astrophysically through pulsar timing arrays, which again are in operation now, and through laser interferometers, which also are in operation now. Things like advanced LIGO, which started up a few months ago, and in the farther future, space-based one. So the third takeaway lesson from, from this sort of new realization is that galaxy surveys have this very deep complementarity that we didn't really appreciate with cosmic microwave background surveys, as well as with astrophysical things like these pulsar timing arrays, and eventually uh, things like LISA, space-based laser interferometers. But in the near term, we've got these CMB surveys. So galaxy surveys, you don't just cross-correlate them with CMB, but you actually take the scalar sector and the tensor sector, and that'll teach you a lot more about cosmic acceleration than, you, than we had previously realized. Depending what type of, of physicist you are, cosmologist you are, you can sort of stand in, in three places. You can be a pure theorist, you can be an observational theorist, someone who actually tries to deal with exactly what the data is saying. Or you can be a phenomenologist, sort of standing in between the two and, and going back and forth between those two worlds. For the pure theorists, they want to write down the action. And then they're doing their, their effective field theory, and they have all these free functions of time. So you have these action functions, which you can think of in terms of, of mass scales in the theory. A phenomenologist will talk about property functions. What property does the class of theory have? How does it, for example, mix the scalar and the tensor theory, what's called braiding? 
what is the kinetic structure of the theory? Is it canonical, or is there some sort of k essence type approach? Or you can deal with these observational functions that I talked about before, these effective Newton's constants, how matter couples and how light couples. And you want to be able to translate back and forth between these. And so this is some work recently done with Scott Watson and, and his graduate student, Gizem Schengler. And we have a whole series of translation tables. So here, for example, is an obs observational function, the gravitational strength, which in general relativity would just be G Newton. And it translates it in terms of these action functions. And these Cs and Bs themselves are actually functions of the, the direct action functions. I didn't write them down because it wouldn't fit on the slide. Here, the effective Newton's constant is written in terms of these property functions, these alpha functions, talking about the braiding between the scalar and the tensor, the sound speed, the, the, the wave propagation speed of the tensor theory, uh, the running of the Planck mass, and, and so on and so forth. And then here are, is the gravitational slip. Again, the difference between the, the gravitational potential, the time time, and the space space one, in terms of the, uh, the action functions and in terms of the property functions. So you can translate between the observations, the phenomenology, and the action. So using this most general theory, what are the most general results that you can get out? And so again, I've highlighted them, them here. In the early time limit, when you're matter dominated, then one can prove that in the entire class of theories, not just in quintessence, not just in DGP, but the entire class of these EFT modified gravity theories, any deviation from general relativity will scale as the effective dark energy density that you have. Okay. People have proved this in specific theories. Now it's been proved for the entire framework of theories. In the late time limit, as you go to a de Sitter future universe, of the, the, the class of Horndesky theories, the slip, the difference between these metric potentials, has to vanish. This has now been proved generally using this EFT framework. And so that's a very important result. In fact, not only can the slip vanish, but you can set the gravitational coupling to be that of GR. And so that makes the entire scalar sector indistinguishable from general relativity in the de Sitter limit. But the tensor sector will still be different. So this again points up why you want this complementarity between galaxy surveys and CMB surveys. You want to be able to know both the scalar sector and the tensor sector. Another interesting thing we were able to show is the slip does not vanish in general, if you go to beyond Horndesky theories, and we explain why within the EFT. In between these two limits, where we actually live and have all our observations, you can't say anything. This has not been appreciated previously. The time dependence of all these free functions, you cannot parameterize in just a few parameters. You cannot parameterize them simply. And I'll show you on the next slide exactly what they look like. So it's very powerful that we can take every dark energy theory, every modified gravity theory that, that can be treated by EFT, and make these three general statements about that. So let's go back to this point of why we can't parameterize them simply. Here's, again, what I showed before, our observational gravitational slip function in terms of these property functions. These alphas themselves are ratios of coefficients that appear in the Lagrangian. So your observable function is, let's see if I can get this right, the ratio of the sum of the products of ratios of sums of functions. So even if this thing was a nice simple, so this depends on the expansion history and the kinetic energy, basically. So even if this was a nice simple function of time, once you do all these ratio and products and so forth, you're not going to end up with a simple function of time. And here are some exact numerical solutions in one of the simplest theories of gravity you can write down, a Galilean theory. And so here are these property functions. Here are the, 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 the three important points that I pointed out before. In the matter-dominated regime, you can predict what the behavior is like. They deviate from general relativity. They deviate from zero linearly with the effective dark energy density. In the de Sitter limit, they all go to constants. In between, where we have the observations, they don't look simple at all. They are not 
simple functions of time. You cannot write one or two parameters down to describe them. Here are the observational functions. Here is the gravitational slip. Here's the tensor wave propagation speed. And here's the, the gravitational coupling. Same thing. You can predict the, the early time limit. You can predict the late time limit. In between, they're not simple. You, you, you cannot write down just a, a couple of numbers to describe them. So to, to summarize this, this part, we have seven free functions in the theory. We only have four observable functions. We're never going to figure out what the exact theory is. Of those four, remember, half of them are actually coming from gravitational waves. We need to observe gravitational waves. <laughs> you have complicated functions of time, and you're not going to be able to reduce those functions down to, to just a couple of numbers. Look at how different this is from what we started off this talk with, talking about cosmic acceleration, the push of gravity. We, were, we didn't realize how successful we were in talking about the expansion history that we took these two functions of time, these WW prime phase space, and brought them down to two numbers, and that was all we needed to know about cosmic acceleration from an expansion history. There we were successful at reducing the functions of time. We can't do that. And we've shown, we've proved that you can't do that for the, the perturbation theory for the scalar and the tensor sectors. So this is somewhat depressing, but on the positive side, these are basically, the theory is so rich that it gives us many more alarms, many more alerts that you do have a deviation from, from general relativity if, in fact, you do. You now have all these functions. If any one of those functions deviates from general relativity, then it tells you you have a modified theory of gravity. Can, can we be more optimistic in the future? If you're clever enough, then you can be. So you have to come up with new types of probes. So some of the assumptions that went, in, went into the effective field theory, you want to break those assumptions with new probes. So as you go into the, the heavily nonlinear regime, EFT cannot handle that. And so then you can try to constrain these functions more. That means we really have to understand nonlinear physics. Very difficult. As we go to very large scales beyond the quasi-static approximation, near horizon scales, then again, you get new functions that come in, and you will have extra information. As you go to astrophysical scales, the details of the screening mechanisms of the gravity also give you additional information. And so that's hopeful as well. On the theory side, if you come up with new theoretical principles, new theoretical symmetries that can constrain your effective field theory, then again, that allows you to reduce the number of, of functions. So to, to summarize, just within the last year or two, there's, there's been this, this sort of sea change in the way we view cosmic acceleration, dark energy, and modified gravity. We realize that everything we've been trying to do, going after the expansion industry, is incredibly important, but there's five times more information than from just that. And so we're, we have to be in it for the, the long haul. There's a lot of, 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 of physics to understand. We realize now that there's this wonderful complementarity between the galaxy surveys and the cosmic microwave background surveys, both of which we're going forward independently and will give information. Now we realize that we really need to, to combine their information together. The effective field theory gives us this, this overarching framework so it's very important on the theoretical side. It can rule out whole classes of theories. But it's not very useful in the practical sense of comparing one for one the observations to the theory. You, you, you can't get a unique theory out from the observations. Unless, in the future, we are clever enough to come up with new theoretical principles or new observational regimes that we can use. So. To go back to, to where I started with, we have that treachery of images, the, the treachery of trying to interpret the universe in, in a very simple way. We realize we have to be a bit cautious on that. Um, we actually have to look at what we're doing when we add scale dependence, when we are modifying gravity, that we get all this extra um, freedom, basically. We don't know what dark energy is. The, the best thing we can say about dark energy is this is not dark energy. Any picture you can put up is not dark energy. And again, the standard model took decades, very complex. Dark energy may be the, the same thing. 
And that's great for the, the students in the audience. It means that you'll have a lot to do. So to finish up, I talked about three things. The, the push of gravity, cosmic acceleration, and dark energy. And there, we've been enormously successful phenomenologically. We've been able to say that everything we want to know about the background cosmic acceleration, we can do by con tightly constraining these two numbers, the, the, basically the phase space of these models. And observations are already well in hand. The BOSS experiment just finished. The dark energy survey experiment is halfway through. The next generation, we have DESI and LSST. We, we are getting good data on that, as well as from the, the microwave background. The pull of gravity, the, the motion of objects under gravity, motion of matter, motion of light, we're starting to measure the growth history. The results we have so far aren't exactly what we expected. And we have to say, is this a real effect, or are we just not understanding beyond linear physics well enough? CMB lensing will be very powerful for not only going after the standard cosmology, but looking for new physics in the scale dependence. Again, we need to be very careful in how we interpret things once we go outside our, our normal framework, once we add this sort of scale-dependent modified gravity. The tensor scale is basically this, this new horizon, this, this, this new um, area that we should investigate. You get this great complementarity between the CMB B-mode surveys, which again are going forward. The, the third generation of experiments are starting to operate this year. There's planning for a stage four CMB experiment, as well as possible satellite experiments. <clears throat> Within effective field theory, we were able to show some very general properties, as well as to give some warnings that you can't parameterize them very simply, the way that, that was successful in the, the, the expansion history. On the other hand, that's more information. We, we have all this extra information to deal with. Um, more ways to see a deviation from gravity, and we definitely need new ideas of, of how to push this further. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Eric. Uh, so, questions? Uh, so, in the, in, the mini, in the minimal version of the effective field theory of dark energy, how many parameters do you have? Uh, depends what, what you consider the minimal version. Yeah, even that would be the question. I mean, just to have an idea or some feeling of... Right, I, it was the idea behind effective field theory is, is you're not model dependent. You're, you're not trying to, to shrink it down. If, if you shrink it down, you might as well just work within a specific model. So you could work within quintessence as a subset of EFT. There are reasons to think that Horndesky theories are, even though they're not the most general, they do have some very nice properties as, as you go into sort of the non-perturbative regime. And so you might say that you're fairly comfortable with Horndesky theories, then you have four free functions, and you have sort of four observable functions. Again, they don't map exactly one-to-one, -one, but that seems more hopeful, having you know, four versus four. <coughs> That, that you think that maybe eventually you will be able to take the observations and go to a, a you know, really narrow down the theory in that way. So Horndesky is, is, I think, something definitely to keep an eye on and, and to, to look at carefully. Okay. If there's somebody else, go ahead. Sorry to ask a second question, but um, you've shown these really powerful results on the background and on linear fluctuations. I just wanted to pick up on the last point you made to emphasize the optimistic side of testing gravity. Mm. That, you know, maybe we shouldn't be so surprised that it's a non-local, non-linear interaction inherently. So maybe we shouldn't be so surprised that to actually constrain theories more generally, we do have to embrace the non-linear regime. And you know, connecting to Katrin Heitmann's talk, do serious simulations of a class of gravity theories. Because I think, uh, at least to some of us in the last five years, what we've seen is that the constraints from stars and galaxies and the, that exploit screening signatures have in many cases been as powerful as the linear regime constraints. 
So, you know, going ahead, maybe the lesson is that cosmologists should learn more about stars and galaxies to learn about gravity. I, I completely uh, agree that, that I think the, the constraints from screening is a, a clear path forward. The, the, the difficult part that I think Katrine would agree with is when you're doing a simulation, you have to adapt you have to adopt a specific theory and a specific parameter within the theory. They're not going to run simulations for 10 different theories with 20 different parameters each. And so the generality of what you learn when you do the simulations, again, you have to be a little cautious on. But I agree, that's, that's the clearest path forward that we have at the moment. So in the, in the effective field uh, approach for dark energy, uh, is there any theoretical insight, for instance, uh, renormalization of the theory or something like that that can help you to constrain the theory, the effective approach? Uh, sorry, I missed the, the key word. Is there any what part of the theory? So the, the renormalization of the theory, I am thinking if the, the gravity can be treated as an effective theory, as an effective field theory, mm -hmm. and you try to have a renormalizable, renormalizable the, theory this, this kind of things can help you to constrain the, the number of parameters that you have in the theory? You're saying that the, the UV completion, is that what you mean? The, the high energy completion? Yes. Right, so it's true. Even if you were able to get all the parameters in the effective field theory, it doesn't tell you the underlying theory because you need that, that ultraviolet completion, the high energy completion. But the idea behind the effective field theory is, is you've integrated out all of those modes and we, we live in a low energy universe, okay? The, the energy scale that we deal with today is much, much less than the cutoff scale of the effective field theory. And so on a theoretical basis, it's true that if you understood a UV theory, then you could derive the, the structure of the, the effective field theory from that. Going from observations, you don't need the full UV theory. You can just go out to the effective field theory. But that's sort of what I mean by the, the new theoretical ideas. If we had a, a UV complete theory, that would help us quite a lot. Okay, uh, one last question. Oh, sorry. Uh, okay, two last questions. <laughs> okay, go ahead, Shirley. Yeah. Okay, Shirley. Uh, when we talk about uh, Last theory of large scale structure, in terms of classical per perturbation theory, we always have to, in an ad hoc way, put a bias term. But when we do EFT, does the bias emerge out naturally and it's already included in this seven functional form? And if that is the case, can we use include bias and amplitude of the scalar power spectrum as like our fifth and sixth observation to constrain these functions? Right, so, so effective field theory of, of dark energy is not taking into account all of the, the, the sort of dissipational physics, all of the, 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 the bias physics, dark matter um, versus, versus galaxies, all of that. So it doesn't have the bias terms. There's another effective field theory of large scale structure um, which does attempt to do that and the, I think the jury is still out on how effective it is in, in dealing with these things. But what I've been talking about here doesn't know anything about galaxies. It's, it's talking about the dark energy, and it's talking about a, a matter term, basically. So you can think of it as a dark matter um, theory. OK, Shirley. Uh, you, no? mentioned the yeah. you mentioned multiple times that we have to be very careful interpreting modified gravity. Is there some particular, uh, there are a lot of literature you think are wrong in terms of how they interpret the results that they observed? So uh, again, for the, for the redshift space distortions, for the galaxy clustering, I would point to the, the papers by um, Koyama and Teruya and, and, and that group as really being very careful about how, how the galaxy clustering and, and the um, redshift space distortions are affected by the modified gravity. So I think right, right now those are the, the papers that I rely on. Okay. Okay, let's thank Eric again. Thank you.